Zoom recording. All right, let's begin then talking about our perception uh, of God. So I want you to think about a time that you have felt God. And I put felt in quotes because it can be seen, heard, felt, tasted, I don't know, right? Like whatever our senses are, I want you to think about a time that you have perceived God in your life and maybe share, if you don't want to share exactly what that time was, what was that perception? How did you perceive God? Do we have to raise hands? Uh, you can go ahead, Hillary. Okay. Um, the most obvious thing that comes to me always when I hear that question is the birth of my children. Um, it's so miraculous that they come out and they have fingers and toes and everything else. And it just, I know that God had to have done that. You know, it just is divine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our tradition actually goes so far as to say that there are three partners in the creation of a child, the man, the woman, and God, right? I mean, our tradition actually says that, um, that without that, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to, to experience that miracle. Okay, good. I like that, Hillary. Diana. Sorry. Okay, it's a little hard here on this phone business. Um, I think for me, like my first reaction was, oh, I see God in a rainbow and, and the whole covenant business. And then uh, my second one was like, Hillary, I was going to say, okay, I saw God in childbirth, but I actually didn't because, well, I don't know. I was pretty drugged up. It wasn't a great birth either time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you were talking to God and through the drugs. I don't know. A different I, issue. <laughs> I, saw, I, saw some, I saw some things. I'm not quite sure what I saw. <laughs> but, anyway, but I think really for me, it was when Kobe, um, I had meningitis and was in the hospital and he was so sick. And Peter knows this because he, he called every single day. He was best friend. Thank you, Peter. I could have ever had during this truly horrible time. And we really didn't know if he was going to make it. He was 13. And I just, I don't know. I just thought about, about Hannah and, and her davening and, and, and for a child. And she said, if this kid makes it, I'm, I'm, I'm giving him up to you, God. I'm giving him up to the Kohen to raise him. And I really, I said, you know, Hashem, if you, just let this kid live and he's all yours. And so I felt something and I don't know what it was. And then fast forward six months and this kid who was completely not religious, angry, all kinds of issues became Jose or Chuva, or some people would say Baal Chuva. And today he's a Chabad rabbi. And people said, how did you feel about it? And I said, perfectly fine. Cause I made a deal with God. I said, mm -hmm. let this kid live and he's all yours. And huh? that's, that's what happened. Nice Diana. Peter. Yeah. Um, I always talk about it, but uh, when I had bypass surgery 18 years ago, I can remember them wheeling me out of recovery and I had breathing tubes and I was trying to ask for my glasses and I asked the surgeon and weekly, you know, did you talk to me and tell me I wasn't going to die? And I had felt myself in this tubal light. And I've, I've struggled with dreaming about this at nights. And the surgeon said, I didn't say a word to you. And but someone talked to me. Mm. And, you know, I got to believe it was God, you know, saying it wasn't your time yet. Um, yeah. So those and, moments of those moments of of trial for us sometimes we hear God's voice, nice. You know, and you, again, it's stopping your internal dialogue long enough to listen. Hundred percent to, to what's going on. So hundred percent, Tom. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, well, these are maybe not life changing uh, moments, but I have I have two examples. The, the the quicker one is just wearing my talit. I, I, I feel the presence of God. I think that's something where you really feel that sort of embrace. And you're also in a, you know, usually in a place where you're going to be 
you know, you're davening and you're thinking, you're thinking about that. So you're getting into a headspace. So, so I think that's one time that I really feel something different, like a change in me as soon as I put that on. So that's a, just a, a regular, you know, common thing. Um, the other thing is music. I think when there's music that's li performed live and people are there together sharing that experience, there's a communication that transcends words um, that's very different than our usual human interaction. So I think it taps into something that connects all of us um, in a different way. So that's so where I sometimes get over, yeah, overcome by those kind of feelings of connection. It's great that you say that, right? Because right as I'm putting together my, my little pictures of possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. For me also music, you can see down there, right? That's part of it, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I feel God's sometimes through music as well. Um, both the creation of it, right? You know, he, hearing hearing what somebody's created and then the playing of it, right? It's 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 amazing, but there are incredibly diverse ways that we as human beings perceive God, and to some degree, I think it depends on how we conceive of God, right? It depends on how we conceive of our relationship with God. Um, there's a lot of different variables that are there, but you can see even just from these pictures, is it, is it when you're alone, right? And just sort of thinking, is it, is it when, uh, I like this sign, it came from a Christian site, because of course I put in, you know, feeling God, and of course it's all Christian, right? Which is a whole different issue of why is we as Jews can't figure out how to express this. But, um, you know, for when I feel incapable, God is able. I just, I liked the way that that was expressed. Um, do we feel God in the reaching out of another human hand, right? Do we feel God through music? Uh, do we th feel God through food, right? The taste of, of incredible food, right? Um, these are all possible ways that we can perceive God. And the question is, what do we do with all of it? So what I thought we would do is sort of go through and talk a little bit about our, what our tradition says about perceiving God. Um, and see which one of these we individually resonate to. So the first actually comes from the book of Shemot, right? The book of Exodus. And it says, and the blare of the horn grew louder and louder. As Moses spoke to God, God answered him, Bikol, Bikol, right? Now that word Bikol up in the Hebrew, um, is often translated as in a voice or in the thunder, right? Or with sound, but there's this audible clearly, right? And actually, if we think about it, the word call is here twice, right? Because it's the call of the shofar, the sound of the shofar that we hear, and then it's responded to by a sound of God. So the question really is, right, what is Bikol? What does it mean? If we're going to say God is responding to us, Bikol, what does that mean? And so there's a couple of options, a couple of possibilities that we see within our tradition. Um, the first is verbal, right? Um, we see two different sections of Talmud that um, have this verbal response. A batkol exclaimed, and a batkol is what the, how the Talmud refers to a divine voice, right? A batkol explained, Kitya ben Shalom is destined for eternal life in the world to come. And Rebbe wept, saying, some acquire eternity in a silver hour, and others acquire it after many years, right? So here's the voice of God actually saying, this person has a place in the world to come, and informing humanity, or informing uh, the rabbi of this, right? Then we also hear, and that's a, a very positive sort of bat kol. We also see in brachot, and then he said to me, my son, what sound did you hear in the ruins? And this was a rabbi that was walking by the ruins of the temple. And he said, I heard a bat kol moaning like a dove, crying, alas, for my children, for whose iniquities I destroyed my house, burnt my temple, and exiled them among the nations. So we hear God giving good news. We hear God sad 
in a voice, right? And, 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 and sad at, at what's happened in the world. But there's clearly this sense, and these are just two examples, clearly this sense of verbal uh, communications by God. Obviously, if we're talking and looking through the Torah, God speaks to Adam, Noah, you know, Abraham, I, well, not so much Isaac, a little bit Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, right? Th there is this verbal communication that we get from God as a way that we can perceive. But maybe the sound, bikol, actually refers to a nonverbal communication. A great example of that is actually Psalm 29. Right? A psalm of David, ascribe to the Lord, O divine beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name, bow down to the Lord majestic in holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. And the word here is kol, right? The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is power. The voice of the Lord is majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks cedars and shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord kindles flames of fire and convulses the wilderness. The Lord convulses the wilderness of Kadesh. The, Lord, the voice of the Lord causes hinds to strip, right? We see in all of this, right, the theme that we get there is not verbal, but the sound of God is the sound of power and influence and change, right? It's effect, right? It's, it's effect that it changes the world, whether it be through thunder or through fire or through all sorts of things, but the voice of God makes change in the world. It's another classic Jewish way of understanding what bikol may mean. This isn't about hearing God talking to us, but it's about that voice of God being an agent for change in the world around us. There are a couple of other ones as well. We see in Amos, Adonai roars from Zion and gives his voice, right? So this voice as a roar. Um, and we even see in Sifre Bamidbar, Moshe spoke to God and answered him, Bikol, in a voice. It's talking about our text. From here is the hint of song from Torah. Here's music, right? Here's music. So we have both verbal and nonverbal as the voice of God within our tradition. Any questions or comments on any of that? Well, there are other divine sounds. Um, that we sort of hear, right? Um, or we can perceive, perhaps. Um, from the Unatanatokef prayer, which is a prayer from our High Holiday Liturgy. Many of you have heard me speak about this before. We see that there are two different sounds that are talked about. The sound of the great shofar and a thin, silent voice. Both of these are sounds of God. And I've taught and I've spoken about this as being the different ways that we can perceive God as, you know, we just went through Passover, the, the crossing of the Red Sea, right? The, 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 the plagues in Egypt, the feeling that God was there holding our hands or pushing us or making change. A lot of times we perceive that as this great sound. Everyone can see it. Everyone can see it. You know, when we see it, when we know it, it's there. But the thin, small voice is quiet, right? And we don't always catch it. We don't always see it. We don't always know it's there um, unless we open ourselves up to it, unless we, we quiet ourselves enough to be able to hear it. And both of those 
are ways that we potentially can perceive God. And I'm moving now out of the realm just of, of hearing. And I'm going to use this as an analogy or use this as an archetype for every sense, right? That whatever sense we're using to perceive God, there are times that God's presence is clear and overwhelming, and they are few and far between, right? Right? And Peter, I would say, you know, that hearing that and acknowledging what that is for you, that was a Red Sea moment for you, right? Um, that was pretty clear. Um, for those who have learned with me in other contexts, and if, you know, you know that I had one of those moments as well when I was uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the hospital as a chaplain at, at NYU Medical Center of, of really having this moment of it being very clear of God's presence. But for most of us in most of our lives, we miss the everyday miracles of life because they're just quiet. And whether it's touch or taste or smell or sight or, or just our spiritual sense, we don't catch them unless we open ourselves up to those moments as well. And to me, that's what Unatana Tokev prayer is, is trying to teach us on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that it's not just about these big cosmic shofar sounding moments, but it's about those thin, silent voice moments as well. And by the way, I believe this is where um, Simon and Garfunkel got their uh, their title of the sound of silence, right? This is where it comes from. This is picked up from a biblical verse. Uh, Peter. I have two thoughts. One, um, I've told everyone in the past, my son is autistic, but he's a synagogue musician. And there are certain times when he plays, you know, and you just feel God working through him. And it's a very, very humbling experience to hear that. And, you know, my daughter has sung with him and they've sung, uh, you know, at the Canners conventions and things like that and at synagogues together. But it's a very humbling experience to hear that this was a child that it just came to. Mm -hmm. um, and these splinter skills of special needs, it's just miraculous how some of this happens. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, we, we had, there, there were two, two, two boxes on our screen today, um, or actually three, because uh, Jack was there too. Um, you know, we had the opportunity on Saturday afternoon of having a bar mitzvah with uh, a young man who also has special needs. And for those who heard what I said to him, I actually said to him, right, he, he is the face of God in that moment, right? I mean, that was, that was a divine moment to see. And, and you know, Rabbi Ern and I were, were speaking afterwards on, on how when, when we first kind of were, were brought to, to say, are we going to, what are we going to do for this, for this young man? We really like, was he really going to be able to do anything at all? Was we don't know. And we've had that conversation with a number of different people. And what we've come to realize is that's our limitation, not him, not his, very often. Well, right. Well, these, these students, these students really um, uh, soar when we give them the chance to, and especially when we give them a tutor like Judy, who can who can really coax coax that out of them and help them see everything that they're able to do. Well, our rabbi at that time was a gentleman named Mark Kaiserman, and he's in Forest Hills now. And when Harris was bar mitzvahed, and they, he was very dubious whether Harris could be bar mitzvahed or not when it all started. And by the time Harris finished, because he wouldn't let the cantor sing or chant anything, you know, Mark Eisenman said, you heard the voice of God coming through him yeah, yeah. during that service. For sure. Um, it Very miraculous. Yeah. But the second thing is, I was at rehab, cardiac rehab today, and it was just very apropos on the, on the radio 
John Osborne's song, What If God Were One of Us, <laughs> was playing. And yeah, it, it does say the saints and the prophets. It does come at it from a Christian perspective. But it's, it is very wondrous what you would say if you could talk to God, Panim, you know, to face to face. Face to face, and yeah, agreed. It, it is, you know, what would you say? And I think that's the question you're really asking. What would you say if you could have that intimate relationship and we were infinite as well, Yeah. where we nice. weren't a finite being? Nice, Peter. So, nice, Peter. So. Judy. Yes. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out how to fit this in. And when you brought up my student from Saturday, it gave me the opportunity. When I hear that about this thin, silent voice, I think of that as our instincts. And over the past number of years, I've been really trying more to tune into my instincts. And that's what I did with, with Jonah. You know, my instincts told me how to work with him. You know, I tried different things and it worked. You know, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of times I will ignore my instinct. It, it, you know, I'll say, no, that, does, that can't be right. And I'll do the opposite and I'll say, later on figure out that I should have gone with my first gut feeling, my instinct. Right, right. So, yeah, I, right. I think of that small voice as our instincts that everybody has, and it's just a matter of tuning into them. Very nice, Judy. So we've talked about perceiving God through voice, through sound, through our physical senses, in essence. But now I want to move to sort of a spiritual modality, right? How do, we, how do we talk about God through a spiritual modality? And one of the most mistranslated and misunderstood um, sections about our relationship with God is it says we are supposed to, it usually translates as fear God, right? We should fear God. The word in Hebrew is yira. Now, yira in Hebrew is different from the word that in modern Hebrew, we would say, I'm afraid, right? If I'm going to say, I'm afraid, it would say, you know, anim fached, right? Pachad is the Hebrew root that we would use for fear the way we're talking about it. So what is yira? Yira is actually a sense of awe. Awe. And many of you have heard me say this before. We as human beings can only handle a certain amount of awe before it come, becomes overwhelming. And when something is so full of awe, we can't handle it, it becomes awful, right? It becomes awful, it, it switches to something, it's just too much for us. And we saw that, right? We saw that in the, in the, in the, the Ten Commandments story when the children of Israel heard God's voice and said, it's too much, Moses, you go, right? But that sense of awe, is a classic Jewish relationship with God. And um, I want us to think about how we perceive God through awe. And there's no better person to help us through that than um, actually Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he wrote in Who is Man? Awe is more than an emotion. It is a way of understanding, right? For Heschel, we understand God through awe, insight into a meaning greater than ourselves. The beginning of awe is wonder, and the beginning of wisdom is awe. Awe is an institution, I'm sorry, an intuition for the dignity of all things, a realization that things are not, are only, uh, the things not only are what they are, but also stand, however remotely, for something supreme. Awe is a sense of transcendence for the reference everywhere to mystery beyond all things. It enables us to perceive in the world intimations of the divine, to sense in small things the beginnings of infinite significance, to sense the ultimate in the common and the simple, to feel in the rush of the passing stillness of the eternal. What we cannot comprehend by analysis we become aware of in awe, right? And this is so classic Heschel, it's even difficult to read right? as, as you go through. But 
But awe is a way for Heschel at least, right? And, and I think for Judaism, this sense of awe, this sense of spiritual awareness, of spiritual, almost on the border of it being too much for us, but it allows us to transcend ourselves, to transcend who we are and go to the next step. Right. If we never feel that sense of wonder, that sense of awe, we're never going to learn. We're never going to grow, he says, because the beginning of wisdom is awe. You have to have that to say, wow, what an amazing sunset. I wonder how that happens. If you never notice the sunset, if you never care, you're never going to find out how it happens. So that sense of wonder, that sense of awe is how we communicate. And, and I will share with you that, you know, I don't know the exact metaphor to use. I don't like to use the canary in a coal mine metaphor because that's always a negative one. But, you know, that, that warning light of, hey, something is going on here. When I feel that sense of being sort of emotionally overwhelmed, I pay attention to that as a possible divine moment. It's one of my cues in my life that I've learned. It's in those moments where I go, wow, right? Whether it be with Jonah on Saturday or you name it, right? Whether it be, you know, in any of these moments in our lives, when we have that sense of awe in the moment, very often the divine is there with it if we open ourselves up to it. Any comments on this? Uh, Peter, go ahead. I know you're a Star Trek fan. Um, that I am. That. <laughs> and when the woman in uh, the Star Trek um, movie is talking to Picard and she asked the question, have you ever experienced a perfect moment? Um. <clears throat> I think that's really what you're saying. You know, it, it's the question, whether it, you know, and she says, you know, be quiet, be still, listen. And it's very true, you know, to be in that one perfect moment where it all comes together. If it happens more than once or twice in a lifetime to people, it is a truly miraculous thing. It's well, never I, happened I would, to me again in 17 years. And I would I, argue it I has the potential. Afraid. I would argue it has the potential of happening if we find our way to open ourselves up to it. I, having been there, I under, I wasn't in fear, as you were saying, and Yara is not, you know, but I did feel the trembling mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't know if you could do it. I can understand how the Israelites didn't want to be in the presence of God because it, it is, it is very humbling and to be in that space. And I can't explain it any more than that, but. So I'll, it, I'll make, uh, I'll make two comments, right? First, actually, um, your Star Trek quote actually sent me to another movie that I that I enjoy. Um, it's actually a Tom Cruise movie called The Last Samurai, and um, there is a a moment where he's the 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 head samurai actually is is he's spent he's spending his life he's looking at the cherry blossoms and he's looking to find a perfect cherry blossom, the perfect cherry blossom, right? And at the moment of his death he actually says they're all perfect, which I found it's, you know, it, it's, it's seeing it's, you know, we, we so often look for the moment that we realize that every moment has perfection in it. If we allow ourselves to see it, to feel it, to, to, to be there, right. As, as part of it. Um, so, so that's, that's actually piece number one. And actually I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on to Tom and to Diana. And then if I have, a chance for piece number two. I'll get back to it. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, most most of what I was going to say we, we've just touched upon, but okay, the idea, but just the idea that without humility, we're not 
really able to experience uh, really requires at least a starting point of humility, um, even though we're part, we can be part of the, the moment as well. But then the other thing which you just mentioned is that not every moment has to be huge, right? We can, it doesn't have to be like all encompassing this like amazing thing. Even the, the smaller things can, can give us a sense of wonder and awe as well. And they're all uh, important and meaningful. Um, that we can't, we don't want to obsess over always looking for that big, big, big moment all the time, so we don't lose the forest for the trees. Right, and and also, by the way, you know, we 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 want to perceive that the big moment is always a, a positive big moment, or a, you know, I mean, look, I, given who I am, and and both my history as a hospital chaplain and what I do here, I have been with many many people at the moment of their passing. And that is always a moment of great awe for me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not always a positive yeah. sort of happy joy moment, right? right. Um, awe is awe. Yeah. Um, awe is awe. Diana. Um, so I was going to say about waiting for that moment, like it sort of ties into what we were talking about last week with um, the. Our, it's a relationship that we have with God. It's not just waiting for that moment. And I mean, really the first <laughs> being that I talk to personally when I wake up is God. I say, like I give thanks to you. And then before I go to bed and I recite um, the nighttime spot, it actually ends with Adon Alam. And then the last thing that I, well, try to, to say is that, and then like I'm like in your hands, like I'm basically I'm putting myself in your hands and then, you know, you hope to like wake up, rinse and repeat. So I yeah. think that for me really just kind of sets the tone of, of where I'm going to be going and how my day is going to be. And when you just start with that total moment of gratitude, you don't have to wait for the most beautiful sunset. You don't have to, and God knows I love sunsets. I'll chase sunsets forever and a beautiful rainbow, but you don't have to do that. God is just there when you wake up and then right. when you go to every, bed. So every moment is perfect. Every time you've lost is having perfect. That, those sort of conversations. Um, maybe it's not exactly that liturgy. Maybe it's something that comes to mind, but it's just, it's really also very much highlighted to not during the Spirata Omer when we're counting and just I would just say you know again like you know to Peter's point about having his moments it's, it's just make every day count and you'll find God there yep nice so we've talked about God in spiritual in in awe but how about intellectual right so you know for me um, I think one of the ways we can perceive God is by learning about the world around us. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even talking about Torah and things like that. And I think we can find God in intellectual pursuit of Torah as well. But I'm even talking about science, right? I'm talking about how, how um, learning how the world works, understanding that and in essence, then learning about, about God. And so I brought a source here that I found actually uh, from Carl Sagan right? From Carl Sagan, science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. When we recognize our place in an immensity of light years and in the passage of ages, when we grasp the intricacy, beauty, and subtlety of life, then that soaring feeling, that sense of elation and humility combined is surely spiritual. So are our emotions uh, so are our emotions in the presence of great art or music or literature or acts of exemplary selfless, selfless courage, such as those of Mons Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. The notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. And you'll find there are a lot of scientists who have found a harmony between religion and science. And there are many who have not, obviously, as well. Um, but for me, I've always seen them as working in tandem. It's just a matter of knowing which question you're asking to which, right? Science does really a really great job at explaining uh, how the world works, but not why. Religion does a great job at explaining why and isn't really good at explaining how. 
Um, and you have to ask the right question to the right place. So learning, learning about the world brings us closer. And I find a lot, that's why I do what I do. That's why I teach Beit Midrash. And that's why I enjoy studying Talmud. As I grow intellectually, as I become a better person because of what I learn, I connect to God in a powerful way and on a different level. And I think it's also important for us to understand the Jewish idea of a hidden God, right? This goes back to that sense of there's a part of God that we can't see, that we can't perceive. And in Tehillim and in, 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 in Psalms and in other places, actually, it talks about God hiding God's face from us. It talks about in the Torah, this particular verse of Tehillim has always been powerful to me. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? There's that sense almost of abandonment, right? Where are you, God? We ask, how can people have that hermit ideology? Well, this is it. It's being reflected right here in the Psalms. Where is God? Where are you? Why are you hiding from me? And sometimes it's the flip, right? It's not the negative, why are you hiding from me? But it's we don't see God because we're too busy. And then all of a sudden we do and we go, oh, right? And I think the most famous example of that is here in Genesis, right? Jacob awoke from his sleep. This is after he had his dream with the ladder. And he said, surely Adonai is present in this place and I didn't know it. Here I was walking around. This is, this is God's place. I had no clue. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Shaken, he said, shaken, awe. There we go. We've got that awe moment. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the abode of God and the gateway to heaven. So sometimes that hiddenness of God creates a challenge for us that we need to discover. It's not that God is saying, you know, uh, I'm hiding from you and I don't want to be found, right? It's almost like, you know, a young child who's hiding and who wants you to come find them, right? Or my dog who's running away, but wants you to chase, <laughs> right? It's part, of, it's part of the relationship, right? That it's not just that God is always going to be there. Sometimes we need to work for it a little bit. And that's part of our relationship with God as well. So a bit of a summary, right? How we perceive God is ultimately based on our personal relationship with God, right? It's based on our own strengths. It's based on how we perceive the world, how we relate to the world around us, right? How, how somebody who is, uh, who is deaf is going to perceive a movie um, is going to be very different than how somebody who is blind is going to perceive a movie. It's going to be very different than how somebody who has both of those senses is going to perceive a movie. That doesn't mean that any of those people can't perceive the movie. It's just going to be different. So we each have to learn our own limitations, our own strengths, and find a way to connect through those. We can perceive God with any or all of our senses. And I add to that spiritual senses and intellectual senses, although they're not really senses by any definition. I just want to expand it past the five senses of smell, touch, taste, sight, hearing, right? Um, all, of the, all of these ways are all ways that we can perceive of God and they all come together. Sometimes we feel that connection undoubtedly, and undoubtedly, and other times we maybe even it may, may even miss it or be uncertain in terms of whether or not that was a moment of connection. But as I mentioned last week, as we collect more and more of these moments, we begin to perceive more and understand more, just like that pointillist painting. The more dots we have, the more perspective we can get the more we're going to start to understand 
that image. Questions. I know this was a this was a big conversation. Tom. Not so much a question, but another thought, which was we're talking a lot about the individual relationship to God here in, in this conversation, but I think there's also the collective uh relationship to God as well. And I keep having to think back to a couple of years ago when COVID was going on and we had the online discussion about whether you can halakhically have an online minyan uh, and you know coming to the conclusion that you can't because you have to be in uh, physical proximity to one another um, in order to uh, bring that relationship to, you know, that interaction with God that you would have in a, in a group. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring that back into the conversation as well. That nice. there's, yeah. Nice, Tom. I like that. Jack. Um, I was going to bring up the hidden God aspect. Yeah, aspect. I know from many people from experience talking to Holocaust survivors and so forth, they feel, feel like God had hid away from them to such an extent that they lost total faith. So hidden God and losing faith and becoming agnostic or atheist are very close. You know, one is hidden God can lead to agnosticism and atheist. Right. So I agree with you. I, yeah, I agree with you 100%. The question is, what do we do with that fact of a hidden God, right? Do we say God doesn't care, in which case I'm not going to care either? Do we say that there's a reason for God's hidden nature, right? There, there are a lot of people that um, describe God, and we even describe God on the High Holidays as a parent, right? Avinu Malkenu is a parent. And if you think about the growth as a parent, and, and I, I highly recommend a book uh, by Richard Elliott Friedman called The Hidden Face of God, um, or something very close to that, if I don't have the title exact, but it's by Richard Elliott Friedman. And he actually traces through the Torah the, the separation between humanity and God, starting from God in the Garden of Eden literally doing everything, clothing them, right? To God taking us out of Egypt, to God speaking to Moses directly, to God speaking to the prophets through dreams, through God being more and more distant as time goes. And he compares it to a parent to say, look, the relationship as a parent you have with an infant is going to be very different than a toddler or a teenager or an adult, right? I have a relationship with my children as adults. My son is 24. I try to stay out of his business. And when he needs me, he will come and say, hey, Abba, I need your help. And then I'll be happy to engage with him. But I'm much more distant because I want to give him his space to be who he is. And I think uh, Dick Friedman sort of creates that narrative of we're at a stage now in our development as human beings and as Jews where we're adults. And if we want God, we need to go to God, not the other way around. Well, let me get back to what I was saying. Go ahead, Just sorry. To go to God, God and so forth. Um, I think that's a question Holocaust survivors ask. We yeah. are with God, and he wasn't there. Hence, he's not there. We're not going to be there, you know, not going to have faith anymore. Yeah, my grandfather certainly did. That was his well, place. I know my parents, my parents, uh, especially my mom, um, has that attitude. Um, she just goes, she, she basically is an atheist who goes through the motions in honor of her parents. That's what she is. And because mm -hmm. she totally lost everything the experience of being in the holocaust wow yeah yeah no it's very real it's very very real and my, my assumption is because we don't know historically my assumption is there were a lot of people who lived during the inquisition who at the end of that had a similar feeling but we don't know we don't have that historical piece uh peter and then brooks I'm more and more convinced after listening to everyone that whether we get close to God or we feel close to God, 
we're not meant to understand this at all by any means. And we can talk about it and we can want that closeness. We want it. We'd love to know what it face to face meant, but we're not meant to, ne never meant to understand it. And, you know, my thinking over the last 17 years, I'm not meant to understand it. I would love to understand what really happened, but I don't think I'm finite and I'm not meant to understand that. And I still want to hear what point two was before you end. And you want to hear what you said? You had a second comment, and I'd like to hear what that was. Oh, actually, I, I fit it in there. It was it had to do with being there at the moments of people's death. That was that was my second point. Um, um, I, I squeeze it in there though. Brooks, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, trying trying to model um, as a Jew, trying to model a relationship with God, looking at our source material. It's really tough, right? Because our material, I mean, everything is like God talking to Jacob, Abraham, Moses, you know, a lot to Noah, and then you have the prophets, and they have this, you, know, you think of Elijah as this torturous relationship, or Jonah, you know, a terrible relationship with God, and they're scared, and they, on and on and on. It's really hard for a common Joe, like an average Jew, to say, like, this is what I want my relationship, you know, to, uh, with God to look like, because this yeah. is what it says in our materials, right? Um and when I talk to, um, when I teach my the Sabra class on comparative religion, talking about Jesus, um, and I said, like, if you talk to Christians about the most appealing thing to their relationship is like, the, is Jesus is a human, and he suffered, and he loved, and he toiled, and he worked, and slept, and bled, and all that stuff, and that's relatable. It's really hard for us as Jews to kind of find that relationship, um, and it actually stimulates a lot of very interesting conversation with the kids. That's something I still talk to some of them about as well. So I agree. First of all, I agree that it's difficult. And which is why I think for most Jews, it's experiential, right? In other words, we go to these moments where we feel, where we experience, where we sense God, as opposed to the intellectual learning. Most of us don't, don't relate to God through that intellectual side, because uh, it's a lot more difficult to, to do that. Um, and it's a lot easier to say, wow, you know, I... You know, when I when I was uh, when I was in high school, um, and I was 16, I had been driving for six months. You know, I took my little Chevy Chevette and I got into a a, a car accident with a one ton pickup truck, and somehow I walked away from that. Right, that's an experience that I can say is meaningful. Um, that's not an intellectual learned sort of thing. It's something that happened to me. I felt it. I was there. Right, and I think most people start with their relationship with God through those moments. Diana. I, I think one of the hardest things when you're talking about these relationships is, um, I mean, I, I definitely don't want to end the class on, on such a down note, although it is somewhat appropriate since we just actually started Yom HaZikaron, is Israel Memorial Day. So it's, sort of kind of a sad day. If we were in Israel, we would only be listening to sad music. Um, but I think one of the hardest things when somebody dies is to say Baruch Dayan HaEmet. Because then and there you're proclaiming like, wow, like blessed is the true judge. Like, oh my God, like, you know, my loved one just died. My loved one was murdered in a synagogue for being Jewish. My loved one, et cetera. I go on and on and on. And we're like still blessing God. Like, that's really, really, really hard to do. And then, you know, you see it on social media, oh, BTE or BTH, however they want to say it. And it's almost like noisy, but when, it, when you really say it, it's, it's for me, one of the hardest parts of the relationship with God to say, Baruch Dayan HaEmet. Look, and it's even and, more than that, right? Because Kaddish also is praising God. Yeah. It doesn't mention death, right? right? We're praising God, but it, yeah, it's, it's a it's, little bit different in a way it because is. it is, uh, and I would say to Tom's it's not point so about proximate. having the collective uh, relationship with God, you know, there are other people. You can't say God is alone. You need 10 other people so that you can even recite it. So you sort of have that built-in support. But when you say it and you're by yourself and it's just you in the presence of that loved one, it's it's pretty hard. And then I think what you're praying for at a certain point is that God's going to give you the strength to get to get through those times yeah um and rabbi uh, harold uh, kushner 
writes a lot about that. Like, you know, God isn't your Santa Claus and, you know, don't think if you're a kid, don't be asking for an Xbox and say, I didn't get it. So, or your PlayStation. So there's no God like that is is to have that strength. That's a good segue for actually two weeks from now, when we talk about God as a source of strength and consolation, Uh, Deborah, and then Tom, and then we're going to close out. Um, You know, listening to the conversation, um, one of the things that I'm thinking about in a relationship with God is that it's, it's an evolving thing. I mean, it's, it's like, it doesn't happen all at one time. It happens through repetition of whatever activity or action or prayer. And it's never, it's never finished. It's sort of, I was thinking about it in regard to tikkun alam. I mean, we're never going to get to perfection, but we, we work towards it and we yeah. work towards that. Um, I don't know if you want to call it a perfect relationship, but whatever perfect is for us, you, you know, through, our, through whatever practice we undertake. Nice. I, think. I like that. Tom? Sort of along those lines and also specific to what Brooke was saying, uh, Brooks was saying before, which is, yes, it is difficult in a sense for us to know where to start having a relationship with God because we don't have it laid out for us in this sort of easy formulaic Christian way, but it also opens up a real opportunity for us to have forge a very personal and unique journey, even though we come together sometimes and we have a lot of traditions and and things that we come together on, but but the, all the personal stuff, I think we just have a lot, we have a lot more opportunity for individuality as well. And I think that's a, that can be a positive, as difficult as it seems to get started. I think it's a it's a real positive. Yeah, nice. Very, very nice. Well, this is a great conversation and and I'm glad we're thinking so deeply about all of this. Um, Over the next two weeks, we're gonna look at God in sort of two different ways. Um, Next week is going to be um, God as exemplar and God as source of wisdom. Uh, The week after, as I hinted at, will be God as a source of strength and consolation. Um, and we're going to look at some, some different ways that all of that plays in. So thank you guys for joining me. And as, uh, Diana mentioned, it is Yom Hazikaron tonight. It is Israel's, uh, Memorial Day, um, 24 hours from now, um, it will be Yom Hatzmaut, Israel's Independence Day. Uh, the two are always side by side. And as we started talking about God, right? It's, it's kind of powerful to think of the fact that in life, right, those moments of sadness and those moments of joy, right, they do, they, they, they come right next to each other. That's life. And God is in there with us in both. Um, and so I encourage you to, uh, to spend today remembering, um, tonight and tomorrow morning, remembering the sacrifice uh, that many, many people made for the land of Israel. And then tomorrow, um, celebrate the joy that is our homeland and the state of Israel. So you can also, people everyone. can also go on online to YouTube. And I would encourage people to do the one, to listen to that siren for one minute, yeah. play the siren and stand and just, and there, you, there's going to be your small, your, 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 um, your moment. Like you said, the long, the lo- exactly your the line that, that you had from um, Unitana Tokef, the, uh, yep. the loud sound and then the small sounds. It's just exactly what that is in my yep. mind. Yep. I just got to say, Rabbi, you really are amazing. You, you're just <laughs> worth staying up for. Thank you. I know it's, <laughs> it's uh, 1130 for you on the East Coast. So I appreciate it. it, it you are really <laughs> just an amazing. Thank teacher. you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. The All best. right, everyone. Thank you. Have a great Lila weekend. Go. I hope I look Thank forward to seeing many of you on over the weekend at our 40th. Bye, all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.